there was a couple of things that I've got called loose ends that I feel like are important, but we either didn't talk about them or they were only in the readings, or maybe I didn't talk about them as much as maybe we should have. So the first one, you need to know who this guy is, Henry Stimson. Can you see it up here better than that before? I'm zooming in on it. All right. Henry Stimson, I'll come back to this slide, was a guy who's been around government for a while. He was William Howard Taft's Secretary of War. Remember, Taft was president from 1909 to 1913. He was Governor General of the Philippines, which remember was a U.S. territory, not a U.S. state, so they had a U.S. governor and they weren't treated like citizens. Then, by the time Hoover was president in 1928, he becomes Secretary of State. And then, in Roosevelt and Truman's administration, he was Secretary of War. So, what do you think this shows you about Stimson that he's in the cabinet for both of these guys, Hoover and FDR? He knows what he's doing, right? There's not a whole lot of people who have been a Republican, excuse me, in a Republican's cabinet, then they're held over into a Democrat's cabinet right after him. So Simpson's one of these guys. So he's very important in the World War II years because he's the guy that oversees this increase in U.S. military capacity as a result of the war. Remember, we went from 14th largest at the start of the war to largest at the end. He's also the guy that really oversees most of the development of the atomic bomb to show you how important the president of the United States, the vice president is, or how unimportant the vice president is. Stimson knew all the details of the Manhattan Project and the atomic bomb, and he had to brief Truman on it when Truman became president. So Secretary of War Stimson knew more details about the war planning than Vice President Truman. All right, but you need to recognize the Stimson Doctrine. This is something the United States comes up with through Stimson when Japan invaded China, and particularly Manchuria. Now you remember we talked about the rape of Nanking and how the Japanese did terrible things to the Chinese civilians? Well, he says that we're not going to recognize any territorial changes that come um, by force. So if you take over another country, we're not going to redraw the world map for that. So, again, it's a result of Japan going into Manchuria in 1931, but saying we're not going to recognize the bullies taking over weaker countries. Another thing I want to make sure you remember is the Atlantic Charter. All right, remember, this was Roosevelt at Churchill's meeting on a ship off the coast of Newfoundland in August 1941. And this is, you know, still four months before the United States got involved in uh, World War II. But it's going to be a joint declaration of war aims. We're saying if we get involved, this is what we're going to do. This is when the United States was just still providing aid to the Allies through um, Lend Lease. This is a term you definitely need to be familiar with. If you watch on the video, make sure you know this. The arsenal of democracy is something the United States was called in the years leading up to our involvement. When we were through Lend Lease aid given you know, the Soviets, the British, the French weapons and war material they needed to wage war. Well, the land charter has eight aims. They're basically saying, we're not going to screw up like we did at the start of World War I. All right, we're going to know why we're going into this war, which World War I was, a, you know, a war everybody didn't really completely know why they were going into it. All right, they said that the United States and Great Britain are not going to try to get any territorial gains from this said that um, everybody's got a right to self-determination. This was the thing that made Churchill kind of bite his lip because he didn't want to be the prime minister that oversaw the fall of the British Empire. But we're saying that any peoples around the world that want to have their own government and not be colonial peoples, we're going to try to look out for them. All right? It says we're going to have greater global cooperation and advancement of social welfare. That's a common sense thing most people say we want. It says participants will work for a world free from want and fear also, we're going to look for freedom of the seas. We're going to make sure there's no um, interference in international trade, lower trade barriers, and then the common sense one, disarm the aggressor nations. Now, I said I wasn't going to talk long about the Holocaust. I do want to make sure you remember what Kristall Knot was. Remember, that's in November, I think, 9th and 10th, 1938. Night of Broken Glass, when the German government carries out pogroms. So that's a government program to bring about death or destruction, in this case, destruction of Jewish homes, businesses, and synagogues. So, we see there a Jewish business um, smashed up and a Jewish uh, synagogue on fire. And you would think that you know most Jewish people see the writing on the wall and they would say, okay, it's probably time to leave Germany. What would be one reason some couldn't come to the United States? Money. All right, money. What would be another reason? Quota. The quotas, right. The immigration quotas from the 1920s that said we're only going to let in a certain number of people from every other country every year. There were other places to go, but a lot of times other countries wouldn't allow people to immigrate there either. And, you know, one of the sad instances was there was a ship that came to Miami in 1939, I told you about, had almost a thousand passengers, and they were mostly German um, Jewish refugees, and we turned them away. We said we'd already met our quota, go back to Germany. All right. Can you pass one of these to everybody? 
mention that you guys want to be served up. And people that are watching will have this email to you, these two documents. All right, what Brooke is bringing you is the period seven framework from the AP people. What Jen is bringing you is a list of World War II documents where each of y'all in the room is going to look at one of them. We're just going to give a short reading and a 30 second summary of that. And what we're going to do with that is you're going to be in groups, and we're going to look at the key concepts in that framework, and you're going to fill in the blanks of this equation up here. And what we'll do is, uh, while they're working, people watch the video, we'll shut the video off, and we're going over it, we'll turn the video back on. All right, you've got how the U.S. won the war. You know, I hate math, so obviously if I give you an equation, there's going to be no numbers anywhere at all. We're looking at social um, things in the United States that led to the U.S. victory in World War II, or U.S. and Allies victory. So I'm going to show you how this is going to work before we start reading the documents. If you look in that um, document that I think Brooke passed to you, you've got period seven. There's three key concepts, 7.1, 7 7.2, and 7.3. All right, I'm going to start showing you how this works by going to 7.2. So if you all flip to the second page of that, find where it says key concept 7.2. All right, you see that says a revolution in, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, revolution communications and transportation technology um, helped to create a ma new mass culture and spread modern values and ideas, even as cultural conflicts between groups increased under the pressure of migration, world wars, and economic distress. All right, I want you to look up here on the board, and since when you're in groups, you come up here to fill in our equation, you're going to be putting, if you're 7.1, all your stuff in orange, 7.2 in blue, and 7.3 in the fuchsia color. Is there more than one, please? It's two pages. Yeah. Well, if you don't have the two pages, we'll get it in a second. All right, can somebody tell me anything up here? Let's look at the part of 7.2 that says migration lead to cultural conflicts. What could we add as like a supporting detail off the side of any of these that was an example during World War II of migration lead to a cultural conflict? Um, the Japanese and American, like when they put the uh, Japanese Americans in. All right, internment camps? Yeah. Okay, what um, executive order brought that on? No, so we can put an executive order. It's 9066. All right, anything else? What about race and segregation? Was there anything that, like migration, led to any conflict between races in America? Um, uh, blacks in the south went up north with dogs or whatever, and that was like race riots in Detroit and New York. And All right, good. There were race riots in Detroit. So we could say. That the great the mass migration that came about from war industries led to Detroit race riots. <clears throat> that's going to be summer of '43. All right, so that's the way we're going to work this out. All right, um, Mr. Gorman, you stop the video for a minute. We'll come back to it. All right, Junior, you had Zeggy Board 9024. What was it? Exercise general, basically, it's general control. Is the government's going to set up the war production board, so it's basically the government taking over everything that is in the economy, directing it towards the war. All right, um, Bobby, Poxton Declaration. It was a proclamation towards um, Japan where they wanted to uh, end the war with Japan by Japan, like giving freedom to the people. Right. It was already laying out how the Allies want Japan to surrender, basically, what they're going to accept for terms of surrender. Rick, you're it. Okay, uh, it was, it was kind of, uh, that the bomb was ready to kind of like, it was like, like, minded to from Germany. It would never have been used against Germany. All right, right. It's saying that the bomb wasn't used against Germany. So it's saying, was well, there some kind of racial uh, motivation for using the bomb against Japan rather than Germany? Because the Japanese as a whole were kind of hated. 
So the thinking there was, why, if you had this great program, didn't you use it to end the war against um, Germany, sir? All right, Corey Metz, who, oh, I'm sorry, we're on 9066 on the group. Um, and basically, FDR gave the Secretary of War the military commanders, um, he made them like oversee the internment camps and this like superseded the attorney general's proclamation of the previous year. So they said that they had to focus on accommodations and on the clothing and stuff. Right, so 966 says that Japanese Americans are basically going to be interned. It gave military commanders the ability to do that with American citizens. Like core maps are uh, it's basically saying that uh, how the permit camps were unjustified, and even though we're at a time of war and like everything's going to be stressed, no matter if it's on military or not, uh, whoever uh, has to be part of this sh shouldn't be uh, put into these situations. All right, right. It's saying that <clears throat> there is a military necessity, so it's okay to put Japanese in internment camps. That was Chief uh, Justice Hugo Black's opinion in that case. All right, Sizzler, Sizzler sorry, to Taylor, Sam. Uh, it talked about how, um, like, the work, like, the views of, like, the scientists actually, like, work on the bombs, and I have knowledge of the bombs. Their um, views should be considered before, like, the immediate use of the bomb. All right. Like, yeah, saying that so the people who made the bomb should be basically consulted before they actually use the bomb. And the response to that, Jen? Um, you're basically saying that everyone's up to him. Like, you're like, you're not going to do anything about it. He's not going to make a chance to, like, like, um, whatever. Yeah. Like, like, and he's like, in one more, it's like, he, like, he doesn't have, like, his moral. It's not like whatever, like, who he wants, like, who All right, good. He says that, you know, morals notwithstanding is going to be up to the president. Um, Savannah. Um, that's what he was saying, like, he used to use on the phone or not, and then he was saying, like, it'll be, like, make, do we let Japan with peaceful homeland, or do we drop it, or? Yeah. Is this it's the scientists who made the bomb petitioning President Truman saying, we should make sure that we give Japan a fair chance to surrender, make sure they know what's coming if they don't surrender before we use it. They weren't saying necessarily don't use it. They are saying at first make sure Japan knows what's coming. Chandler, the Bracero program? Uh, this was a set of like uh, the provisions and laying out the agreement between uh, Mexico and America for the Bracero program, which is where uh, Mexican farm workers would come over here and not and wouldn't have to go through the normal immigration process to work or whatever. It was just laying out the rights as workers what they were and weren't entitled to, and um, according to an, an article, and it was like four provisions, and then an article laid out. Right, and it said that they um, could be discriminated against, but they also could take jobs from American workers. Then the three that y'all didn't read were 8802, was again FDR saying there should be no discrimination in wartime industries. And one of the quotes from that document was that as long as we have people that are willing to work and we need the work done, it's just dumb to not use them as workers. So it's saying that um, African Americans cannot be discriminated against in wartime hiring. Well, say so you can't discriminate against a bunch of groups. And then Dr. Levin ties in with that as an editorial from a paper about the double V, saying that uh, this was a campaign pushed for by NAACP that after fighting the fascists, um, African Americans who served in the military should also not accept second class citizenship, saying, why would you risk your life to be treated as half of a citizen in the United States? The document 12 is a Frances Perkins um, letter, who was the female Secretary of Labor, saying that women should be given equal pay. That it doesn't make sense for women who are doing the same jobs as men to get paid less. And basically, it's going to devalue their status, also it devalue the status of the jobs, and that men coming home from the war might end up getting paid less. All right, now what we're going to do, and Ms. Warren, you saw that for a minute. 